And I have one particular purpose in this exhortation this morning. And that is that by the time we get to the end of it, we will have just perhaps a degree of appreciation greater than we came with of what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us, the final generation of Christadelphians, and there's no question we will be, what he did for us, brothers and sisters, in that record that we read in Luke 17 and 18. We concluded our study class this morning with the cry of Sodom, which we saw quite clearly was the cry of a man, heavy of heart, vexed of soul, who cried from the depths of the problems that he found himself embroiled in in Sodom, with his family disintegrating, his wife cozying up to the world, (coughs) cried out to God for some intervention. And it came. That cry is matched in Luke chapter 18 with the cry of a widow woman. But she's crying to an unjust judge, not to the God of Lot and the God of you and me. You want to just, in the brief time that this exhortation, because it will be brief, just to give you a sketch of what our Lord Jesus Christ is driving at in Luke chapter 17. So if you'd like to join me there, Luke chapter 17, I'm going to pick this up from verse 20, not that I'm going to try to give you a verse by verse exposition that would take a lot longer than we have just to see some of the elements that are here in this wonderful section of scripture that was designed for you and me no question about that when you come and you read down this context the first thing you encounter is the term day or days did you notice that have a look with me at verse 22 And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Step down to verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Have a look at verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. What do you think he means by days? Particularly the days of the Son of Man. We understand the days of Noah. What were they? 120 years of opportunity. That was the days of Noah. 120 years of opportunity. What was the days of Lot? What we saw this morning. All of the opportunities that Yahweh gave to him. Interventions in his life that he ignored. They were days of opportunity, brothers and sisters, just like you and I are now in the days of the Son of Man. Son of Man is our Lord Jesus Christ's title as the judge of all the earth. The one who will exercise dominion over all carnal things as we saw perhaps last weekend if you were at Book Road. He's the one who's coming to determine our destinies. He's about to make his appearance in the earth. We know from the signs that's the case. We're living in the days of the Son of Man. What are they? just like they were to Noah's generation and to Lot's family and his ecclesia, they were days of opportunity. Five times you read the plural days. Because if you see them for what they are and use them wisely, you'll get divine grace in the day. And five times he uses the singular day. Have a look at the end of verse 24. So also shall the Son of Man be in his day, singular in the Greek. Have a look with me at verse 27. This is what they were doing in the days of Noah. Until the day. Look at verse 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. Look at verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day. And look at verse 31. In that day, again, (coughs) five. The divine number of grace. Okay. If you use these days of opportunity wisely, you'll get grace in the day. The day of judgment, brothers and sisters. And that's what this context is all about. 
And the entire context is woven around the, the life of Lot and his wife. I'll demonstrate that to you. It's not hard to demonstrate, by the way. It's all built around Lot and his wife, which is why we've chosen it for the exhortation. So let's pick the record up from verse 26 of Luke 17. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So what were they doing? Now in verse 27 and verse 28... There are nine verbs used in the Greek by the Spirit. Those verbs all have the identical grammar. Plural, imperfect tense, active voice, indicative mood. means nothing to most people. All we want to focus on is the imperfect tense. Imperfect tense means an action has begun is in progress, but is terminated before you get to finish what you're doing. Okay? That's what it means. Perfect tense is past tense. Gone. Imperfect is you're in the progress of something, but you don't get to finish it. So read it this way. This is how the grammar should be translated. I'm going to read verse 27 and verse 28. See how relevant this is to the days in which we live, the days of the Son of Man. They were eating. Now he doesn't mean here by eating, doing what we will do at lunchtime, God willing, going downstairs and having a potluck lunch. He means restaurant type eating. The world's full of them. Restaurant type eating. They were drinking. He doesn't mean lifting a glass of water. He means pub type drinking. Okay? Entertainment type drinking. So they were eating, they were drinking. They were marrying wives. They were being given away in marriage. That's because, of course, they were jumping into one marriage and out of that one and into another one and out of that one into another one. That's the age we live in, isn't it? Yes. Until the day. And there came a day. Verse 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, they were drinking... They were buying, they were selling, they were planting, and they were building. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. There's the pattern set. Why do you think the Lord Jesus Christ chooses those two eras of divine judgment? Noah's day and Lot's day. He could have chosen any era of judgment, couldn't he? He chose them because they have a common denominator. And the common denominator is general prosperity. Now, when I say this sometimes, people come to me afterwards, the meaning, and say, I'm I'm not rich. I'm not talking about you being rich or poor brothers and sisters. We're talking about the society we live in. All right? Is it prosperous? Go and ask your grandfather. Ask me, if you like. I know what I did as a child, and I'm not going to describe it now, because you'd laugh. Yeah. We did things that were ridiculous. Ridiculous to this society. They know nothing nothing about it because, you see, we've had so much prosperity. Our kids think that this is normal. It's not normal. For nearly 6,000 years, people have lived like Abraham lived or a little bit like that. Not anymore. Everybody lives in a palace now. Everything opens and shuts. You can go down the street, you can buy anything you like. It's a different age. Okay? That's what this age is about and it's described here. But you see, why he chooses these two eras is because they did have that common denominator. General prosperity. And therefore distraction. The things, the truth. But it all came to an end very quickly. In the same pattern, we will be removed, brothers and sisters, before this prosperity that we enjoy, or at least the world enjoys, disappears. Because it disappeared. When God locked Noah away in the ark, within a week it was all gone. When he took Lot and his family out of Sodom, the same day it was all gone. Get a picture in your mind. Those people in Sodom got up that day, didn't they? Like every other day, they went down to the local coffee shop and they got their latte. And they sat there before they went to work in the terrace, sipping their latte. And kaboom! 
It all disappeared. So it will be again. We will be removed on the eve of the Great Depression that the world knows is coming, and when it comes, it's going to be big. It's also going to be the fulfilment of Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And you're familiar with that passage, aren't you? And at that time, notice what I'm saying, at that time, remember that phrase, shall Michael stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation on earth. And at that time, same time, many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The resurrection and the collapse of the financial and economic systems of our world in the Great Depression will be concomitant events. They will happen at the same time. And this world's going to descend into a time that they have never seen in their history. And their prosperity will disappear, which is why America is ruined. It plays no part in the events of Armageddon, as our pioneers taught. No part. Neither will China, the two dominant nations in economic affairs today. They'll be gone, undermined by that Great Depression. And so will you and I. We'll be gone, but in a different sense. We'll be at Sinai, awaiting the determination of our destiny by the Son of Man. Yeah, that's what this is about, brothers and sisters. That's why he chooses these two eras. And our Lord Jesus Christ was quite concerned about you and me. Did you know that? Yeah, he tells us here. Come down to verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, you know, so this is the day of destiny. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He is in the field, let him likewise not return back. You know what they used the housetop for in Israel? In the times of Christ and before, houses were designed in the shape of the altar of incense, weren't they? They had a balustrade around the, the roof. You could get up on the roof. That's why those men could take those part of the roof off and lower their friend down. See, they're up on the roof. They had an outside set of steps. And the practice was, if you were spiritual, when the man came home from his work in the field, he would go up the outside steps, he would go up to the top of the house, and there he would meditate and pray to prepare himself to enter into the house and to do his duty and obligations downstairs. Housetop was used for prayer and meditation. So the Lord expects to find us, brothers and sisters, meditating upon the word and praying. He expects to find that. But he also knows there's a danger. That's why he says here, if you're on the housetop, don't come down to take your stuff out of the house. Now the word stuff there is in the Greek. You look it up, it's skios. I like that word, it's sort of skewed. Yeah, skios. And it actually means implements or equipment or apparatus. I like to add a word to the lexicographers. Gadgets. Yeah. Now I don't think the Lord contemplated as he looked down the corridor, because he's actually talking about our generation. This is when he returns. Okay? I don't think he looked down the corridor and saw some Christadelphian in his mind trying to marshal a huge refrigerator out of the door. I don't think he meant stuff like that. But he might have meant something like that. Mm. Which some people have to get an operation to get off their hand. Life in the modern world is dominated by that gadget. You can be anywhere at any time in the world exposing yourself to everything that Sodom and Gomorrah offer with that gadget in your hand. You can do that in Tim Hortons or McDonald's. I think you might be concerned about that one. But I'd suggest, I've got a piece of advice for you. I took a group of brethren to Mount Horeb, where you and I are going to go for our judgment. 2015. Don't bother taking it. There's no, no reception and no Wi-Fi there. I think the Lord understood the times in which we would live, brothers and sisters. He knew the dangers, the perils of our time. I use gadgets, but I am not going to let that thing dominate my life. And I'm not going to let it get in the way of prayer and meditation. 
He which is upon the housetop, let him not come down. Down? Down. Got it? Let him not come down to get his stuff out of the house. You are going down. So here's our Lord's warning to the final generation. You know, he says in verse 32, remember Lot's wife. He just told us he's talking about the days of Lot. And now he says, remember Lot's wife. This whole context is built around the story of Lot and his wife. And he lays down a principle that will govern people's destinies in every generation, including the millennial generation. That's the principle of verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by saving your life? Well, he's just said, remember Lot's wife. So there's your clue, isn't it? What did she want to save? What did she want to preserve? Well, the way of life she had. She didn't want to leave that behind. I mean, how could you possibly miss the next episode of the soap opera? I mean, you can't do that, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what about the game that's coming up? You know, that and whatever you play in this country. What is it, baseball or something? I don't know. Ice hockey? What about that coming up? Can't miss that. Yeah. You want to save what's got, what this life has got? Watch out. You may lose the one to come. That's what he's saying. But that, that's going to apply to every generation. It'll apply to Lot's generation of old. It'll apply to the millennial generation. That's why right at the end of the millennium there's a rebellion. In a perfect government, a perfect environment, there'll be a rebellion. How are they going to get, how are they going to get people to support a rebellion in that era, do you think? Well, they're going to apply the test of whether or not you're going to keep your head. Yeah, that's what Revelation 20 implies. Because it talks about the first judgment and it says these are those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. How many people do you think you're going to be at the judgment seat with who were beheaded? John the Baptist? Paul maybe? Not too many. But you see, we're also told about the judgment, the second judgment at the end of the thousand years. How are those people going to be tested? What kind of weapons do you think that the rebels might have to impress people? with the notion that they might join the rebellion. M16 rifles? Don't think so. Because all they will have is agricultural implements, like axes and machetes and scythes, which are very good to cut people's heads off. Yeah. So the same principle applies at the end of the millennium. Knock on the door. You'll join us or you'll lose your head. That's the principle, isn't it? Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life, give up what the world's got to offer, shall preserve it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? And then he he takes us back to Genesis 19. Ten times he's talked about days and days. Now look at verse 34. I tell you in that night, excuse me Lord, you're talking about days. I tell you in that night. What's that about? Genesis 19 verse 1 just happens to say that the two angels who came to rescue Lot and to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah came in the evening when you can most expect people to be home. It's not always the case nowadays. But if you want to choose a time when people are going to be home, mum and dad... And the kids, when would it be? In the evening. Yeah. So you get your knock on the door in the evening. Don't expect a call from me. Because if I happen to be in Australia, I'm going to get mine 15 hours before you. But I'll be leaving my gadgets behind. You'll get no call from me. And that night will come, brothers and sisters, and the two angels will be at my door because there's two responsible people in my house. That's why there were two turned up to Lot's house. Two responsible people in that house. An angel for each. It's like we've got an angel, each one of us. And we'll be taken off to the judgment seat. And that's what the next verses in Luke 17 are about. Look at them. Now you can safely cross out the italicised words in the following verses, 34, 35... 
36. Because the italicised words are men, women, and uh, men in verse 16. Cross them out of your Bible, they're not there. He's not talking about two men or two women. He's talking about a husband and a wife. And he has in mind Lot. And he's, he's just told you that. Lot and his wife. Okay? So what's this about? Verse 34. I tell you in that night there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other left. And it goes on like that, doesn't it? You've got, in verse 35, you've got two grinding together. They're working. They're labouring together. Yeah, this is the grind of, of ecclesial labour. In verse 36, there are those who, who think that that shouldn't be there at all. But if it is, there are two in the field. What field do you think that might be? Yes, the field of divine service, isn't it? The one should be taken and the other left. Now, I'll tell you what left doesn't mean. It doesn't mean left behind and making no appearance at the judgment seat, does it? Because Lot's wife was taken out of Sodom. Mm. She was not left behind. So it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Well, let's take the word taken, first of all. It's the Greek word paralambano. It means to take one into a marriage. Proof? Its first uses in the New Testament are in Matthew chapter 1, where the angel comes to Joseph, who's about to put away Mary, his now pregnant wife, the spouse wife, and he's not responsible for this, so he privily wants to put her away. And the angel says to him, Joseph, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. There's your Greek word, paralambano, take unto thee. It's about taking someone into a marriage. Yeah, so when the judgment seat is conducted and it comes the turn of Lot and his wife to appear as contemporaries, just like you and I, will all appear as contemporaries before Christ and we're going to be the first cab off the rank, by the way, brothers and sisters. Our Lord Jesus Christ won't be interviewing anybody. That will be done by the angels beforehand. All he's going to do is smile and wave or grimace and wave. And as we come before him, Family, ecclesial groups, because it's very necessary that if we are going to be rejected, that the world knows it, that our brethren know that, it will be shouted upon the housetops. Okay. Our Lord will look at those folk in front of him and look straight in the eyes of Lot, smile, and use his open right hand with the five fingers of grace, because this man is going to get grace, and wave him to the right hand. But standing beside Lot will be his wife, now converted from a pillar of salt into a living human being again. And he will look at her and say, I'm sorry, dear, but you're on my left. Okay. So is that what the word left here really means? Yes, it does. You know what the Greek word is there? We see left at the end of verse 34 and again 35 and again 36. And again, verse 37. You know what that Greek word is? Arphiami. And Arphiami is the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses on several occasions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he says, concerning a believing husband who has an unbelieving wife. What does he say? If she's happy to stay in the marriage, he says, Let him not put her away. Arphiami. Arthiami means to put someone out of a marriage. So while Lot goes to the right, Lot's wife goes to the left. He goes into the marriage. She is put out of the marriage. The whole thing is built around the story of Lot and his wife. But then we come to verse 37 of Luke 17. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? So what are they asking? Where are they left? See? That's what they're asking. Where are they left? If you're going to be taken into marriage, of course you're going to 
you? With the bridegroom, aren't you? But if you're cast out of the marriage, where are you left? Well, we know, of course, that it was also designed partially for his own generation, some of whom would be alive in AD 70. We know that the Roman eagles would gather around the city of Jerusalem, packed with two million Jews, and one million of them would perish. It's like a carcass. And the, the Roman eagles would come and pluck the flesh off the carcass of Jerusalem. Yeah, that was the import for his own generation. But he's not designing this for them. Specifically, it's for you and me. So what does that mean to you and me? Where did Lot's wife end up? Not too far from the place she really wanted to be. As a pillar of salt. You get what you want in life, brothers and sisters. You get what you really desire. That's what she wanted. That's what she got. Left in the place where she really wanted to be. But couldn't enjoy it, could she? Then we have a parable. There's no chapter division, of course, in the record. Christ sweeps straight on. He's given us that platform. And he sweeps straight on in verse 1 of chapter 18. And he says, and there's a word missed out by the translators of the King James here. It's a very simple word. It's a preposition, K, K K-A-I. And it should read this way. And he spake also a parable unto them to this end. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. So what do you think he's doing here? He's just used the fabric of Lot's life for our good in the latter days. He says, I know what it's going to be like for you. It's going to be like Lot. You're going to live in a terrible world. A world of carnality, of violence, of lawlessness and wickedness and people getting away with the abomination that Yahweh hates and the governments and the folk around justifying and glorifying them in the process. And you're going to be worn down by humanism. It's going to come at you. Liberty, equality and fraternity. How dare you say anything bad about these people? Right? That's where we're up to, brothers and sisters. He knew that. Brother Carter has a very good comment about this parable in his book, Parables of Messiah. This is what he says. The background of the parable is the idea of a time of waiting, of apparent delay, which would be perplexing to men of faith in every age. The conditions of the world would be conducive to disappointment and despair. When disciples might lose hope in his coming again. Jesus therefore prescribes the antidote to counteract the effects upon the disciples of the conditions prevailing around them. Yeah. So this is an antidote, isn't it? What do you take an antidote for? For for a problem you recognise. If you don't recognise it, you don't take antidotes, do you? But if you recognise the problem, you take an antidote for it. And here's your antidote for the days of Lot. What is it? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. So that's what he's going to do in a parable of an unjust judge and a poor widow woman. You can see that word there, to faint, at the end of verse 1 of Luke 18. It's a word in the Greek... Ekakio, which means to lose one's courage, to lose heart, okay? to lose your courage and to lose your heart. Christ was worried about that. He had good cause to be worried about that, brothers and sisters, because I know quite a few have lost their courage and have lost their heart and have walked away. I know quite a few. So what's the answer for you and me? We must build into our lives as every day of this evil generation passes the antidote. And the antidote 
is continual prayer. Regular prayer to our God. He wants to hear from us the cry of Brantford and of Brisbane and of Ancaster and of Toronto. So what will be the cry of Brantford? Christadelphians who see themselves in Lot's position, being overwhelmed with the age around them and crying out, not giving Yahweh any peace, any day of their lives, crying out for him to send his son. Now he's not going to change the day, but the very process of you doing that will give you the courage to go on and he will intervene in your life in ways that you didn't imagine to give you the courage to go on. So he speaks this parable in that context. Now I'm going to give you a, a detailed exposition of it. You know the parable pretty well. You've got an unjust judge who fears not God or man in verse 2. He has no respect for anybody. And there's a widow in verse 3 in that city and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of thine adversary. Now the adversary there is an opponent at law. And you know, Lord Jesus Christ pointed out, of course, that the scribes and Pharisees, some of them were not unknown, to be ripping off poor widows. He says that in Matthew 23, doesn't he? So they've ripped off this poor widow. She's got nothing. She hasn't even got two mites. So she comes to this judge to get some vindication from her oppressor. He doesn't care about her. See verse 4. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now I love the, I love the way the Lord presents these parables. It's graphic pictures. And he deliberately uses exaggeration here. Hyperbole. Quite deliberately uses exaggeration. As I'll show you in a minute. Okay. But it's to teach a lesson. Because you and I are not dealing with an unjust judge when we make our supplications to our Father in heaven, aren't we? Yeah, he, he's nothing like this judge. When we make our appeals to him, he doesn't always answer exactly at the same time that we would like an answer, but he answers. Even the silence is an answer. Because his timing's always perfect. He'll answer when it's best for us. And we read that, of course, in verse 7 when we get to it. He'll answer when it's best for us. So what about this widow woman? Just, I want you to get a picture in your mind. The Lord didn't speak parables so that we've got nice stories to tell our kids. He spoke parables so that you can get a graphic image in your mind. So that you can actually put yourself there in the picture. So put yourself in this picture. You've got this unjust judge, you've got this poor widow woman. Now, widows were oppressed, of course, they didn't have social security in those days, did they? So she's coming up to this judge's door every day, several times a day. She's knocking on the door. And he opens and says, what do you want? Avenge me of my adversary. Get out of here. And he shuts the door in her face. And this goes on. Another hour. Come on. Get away. Shuts the door in her face. And he does, he does this for some considerable time. She keeps coming back, persisting. And, he's, and we read in verse 5. And I want you to notice how important verse 5 is. By reading verse 6. You read verse 6. What does it say? And the Lord said. So the Lord turns to his disciples and said. Now were you listening to this parable? Did you actually hear what the unjust judge said? Did you get it? So it's very important we understand verse 5. When it says that. Yet because this widow troubleth me. He's not saying these words publicly because the previous verse, verse 4, tells us he said within himself. This is happening inside the brain of this unjust judge. Because this widow troubleth me, and the word troubleth there in the Greek means to wear out with toil, okay, wear him out with toil, I will avenge her or vindicate her lest by her continual coming, literally, her coming unto the end. She's never going to give up. In his brain, he thinks, 
This woman is so persistent. She is never, ever going to give up. And one day, I fear, this is what he says at the end of verse 5, lest by her coming to the end, she weary me. Now, in the Greek, we have the word hupo, piezo. Now, hupo is the Greek word for under. Hupo piezo means to hit under the eye. You ever been hit under the eye? What happens to your eye? You get a black eye, don't you? Yeah, that's what that word means. It's only used twice in the New Testament. The other occurrence is the first of Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, where Paul, using the figure of athletics, he's talking about pugilists, he says, I don't shadow box, you won't see me beating the air. He says, I keep my body under. In other words, he beats it black and blue, in the spiritual sense. Right? That's the only other place you read this word, hupo piezo. It literally means to give someone a black eye. Now think about this. This is ridiculous, isn't it? Think about the hyperbole here. This poor little widow woman, avenge me of my adversary. And he opens the door. He begins to think this way, that one day he's going to open that door, she's going to go, boing, and give him a black eye. We laugh. But we need to get the point. Did you hear what the unjust judge said? Yeah, we've got to get the point of this, brothers and sisters. When we make our lot-like appeals and our daily prayers, we ain't dealing with an unjust judge. We're dealing with our merciful, gracious, heavenly Father. That's what he says here in verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect? I want you to notice the language. Which cry day and night. Yeah, I think he might have a lot in mind. Which cry day and night. He's been talking about days, hasn't he? And then he says, I tell you in that night. Yeah, cry day and night. This is a whole day affair. A whole day affair. Shall he not avenge them? Though he bear long with them? That sounds like he's putting up with us, doesn't it? That doesn't mean that God's putting up with us, brothers and sisters. The word in the Greek simply means he's long-spirited. In other words, God sees the end from the beginning. He knows what's best for us. He knows that answering your immediate prayers right then might not be the best thing for you. Maybe you need to be tested in Sodom for a while. Maybe that will sort out what you really desire. Okay? His timing's always going to be perfect. And when it happens, it's going to happen so quickly, we will be swept off our feet. Just like when the angels turned up to Lot's house in Sodom. There's no time then for going back and saying, Oh, I've got to get some more oil in my vessel. Oh, oh I've got to do the things that are right. No time then, brothers and sisters, too late. And then he says this. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. It will all be too quick. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man, that's his title as judge of all men. John 5, 27. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, of course, we all, we all will know. We all know. You look at the Greek text, there's an article before the word faith, isn't there? sometimes we use the wrong one and we ask the question when the son of man cometh will he find the faith meaning a people who have got a set of doctrines called the Birmingham amended statement of faith of course he's going to find people who believe the truth we know that from the rest of the bible there's many places that tell us when Christ comes he will find the truth on the earth he's going to find a community of people who have got a right set of doctrines because some of their children are going to go into the kingdom as mortal inheritors of the land. You don't get there unless your parents are in the right place. We know that from Ezekiel 47, all over the Bible. We know from Revelation 16, 15. He's not going to find an absence of truth in the earth, but he's worried. 
You know what he's worried about? The article we should use there is not the faith, but this faith, because it's a reference to the kind of faith revealed in the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Is he going to find that kind of faith? Is he going to find people crying day and night unto him for vindication from their enemies? Is he? Brothers and sisters, I don't think our Lord Jesus Christ could do any more for us than what he's done. He died for us. And he gave us the best advice that you could ever give. to be very grateful for that. We do live in the days 